Brands on Brands. All right, hey, it's Jeff Holkerson here with FrogBro.com. And if you want to learn more about SEO for your business website and how to make your design stand out among other businesses, check out this latest episode of Brands on Brands podcast. In a world where content is king and your reputation is your brand, how do you build a brand that matters? Welcome to Brands on Brands, a home for those that think different and push their boundaries. This is where branding that matters lives. Now, here is your host, Brandon Berkmeyer. Hey, hey, what's up? Welcome to Brands on Brands. I'm Brandon Berkmeyer, your personal branding coach. And I believe that building a brand that matters is the only way for a business to thrive tomorrow. Thanks for tuning in today. It is an interview show. We've got a great chat for you today all about how to build a better website, better website design and usability, better websites for search engine discoverability. And also, if you are someone who's been around with a website for a while, how to get the courage to get out there and get it refreshed so that it can start delivering more against your business right now. The person we're talking to today, the expert in the industry, is Jeff Fulkerson, aka Jeff Fro, aka the owner and founder of FroBro Web Technologies at FroBro.com. It is hard to say. I will admit that. Uh, but I love this guy's personality. Jeff had the courage to call his website and brand frobro.com, which we do get into the story behind that. But do not be fooled. He is a professional, an experienced professional that knows what he's talking about, which you will hear today. Let's talk a little bit more about his company, Frobro. They solve the headaches of low quality, underperforming websites for local businesses. They go ahead and craft your personality and business authentically into a one-of-a-kind unique message that makes you stand out in today's crazy economy, helping you get raving fans so, so that you can finally reach your business and lifestyle goals. He personally knows the impact of a great website and what that can have on your image and the perception of others and wants to help other business owners stand out and be represented online in the best way possible. Also, He's on a mission to rid the world of terrible websites. What's not to like about that today? All that and more covered. Hope you guys are ready to dive into our chat all about your website. Check it out. Brands on Brands. All right, let's get going. I'm excited to welcome our guest today, Jeff Fulkerson, to the show. Welcome first and foremost to the show, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Brandon. Absolutely. Well, the reason I'm excited is we do get to dive into a topic that actually, maybe negligently, we haven't talked about a lot on this show. And I actually, looking back in the archives, I'm like, who have I brought on to talk about things like website design, search engine optimization, like how to make a good decision about how you're managing your, your site. And I really haven't done that. So shame on me, everyone. Shame on me, first and foremost. <laughs> but that's what we're going to talk about today. And it seems more people, Jeff, are getting comfortable creating their own websites, creating content in some form, which I love. I love that people are getting more comfortable building these businesses, but I think they need experts like you to help them along the way, whether it's for advice or to get the thing built and get it done so they're not dragging their feet. But I want to start with this question. Why is a high performing website, a well-designed website, why is that so important? Why does it matter? That's a great question. And I think more and more businesses moving online these days, our marketplace is becoming more digital. Uh, I mean, with the pandemic too, more people are at home in front of their computers transacting business that way. And so if you're neglecting your uh, online presence, then you have missed opportunities to work with those people. More and more people look to the website to determine whether or not they're going to hire someone so you need to have a good first impression there. Uh, if they, if your company doesn't have a website and someone tries to look you up, they're just going to keep moving on. It doesn't matter if you're actually good at what you do, you're going to get judged by your website first before people find out how good you are at that thing. So you kind of have to have it these days. And uh, while I agree, it's great that you know a lot of these companies are offering free self-page builder websites, 
you know, that's the starting point, but don't stay there. So it's better to have a website than not have one, but just realize there's a lot more that you're missing if you're just trying to do it yourself. Let's talk about what people should have first. Let's say they are doing it themselves, right? Like you can hire people like you uh, at frobro.com if you guys are interested in in like getting help. But before that, let's say they wanted to tinker around a little bit. What do you think that they should get done to get it out the door? Because you could waste six months trying to build something yourself that's super complicated. But what do they need to just get started? If you're just getting started and you just need something, uh, just do a simple one-page website with a few different sections that convey who you help, what you do for them, why you're qualified to do that. Maybe mention a couple of testimonials, people you've worked with, and then a contact form. And that's the very basic essence of putting yourself out there. People can see what you do, why they should hire you, and how other people have liked working with you. Plus, there's the way for them to now contact you to go to the next step. So that's the simplest thing. Don't overcomplicate it. And why is that? Why? What do you, what do you think people are doing? Like, what are they doing to complicate it that is making it not like an ideal situation? I think there's a shiny object syndrome. When you start going into these page builders and you're like, ooh, I can put these sliders in and I can add pop-ups. And if you're putting those things in without realizing the effect on the user and the user experience, or even what it does to the performance of your website, you're gonna be making some mistakes. So if you put in a whole bunch of images that are too big and you haven't shrunk them down, your site's gonna load really slowly and people don't like to wait around for websites. They'll go to the next one. Uh, If you're popping things up in people's faces, that's annoying. And now they associate you with annoying behavior, even though (laughs) it's just the website. So things like that, if people just, you know, oh yeah, I saw a website one time that did this. I think that would be really cool but they don't really have a reason for it or it doesn't fit in with the message they're trying to convey. Yeah, I've seen that a lot and I'll I'll admit guilty as charged, right? Like when I got started years ago, I built a website that I ended up never launching. I spent months building this thing. And to your point, it definitely had pictures that were way too large that slowed the load time down uh, in terms of file size. It definitely had extra little pop-ups and those scrolling, you know, like headers because in my mind, they looked good, but they weren't, I'm sure, going to do anything to drive towards a call to action that was going to be important for me to get the business going. But really what what messed me up was it was all the time I wasted. Instead of getting out there and starting a business and growing and networking and starting to sell things, I was trying to build this fake business because I was afraid of, you know, I had imposter syndrome that if I didn't have this website, I didn't look like a business. And if all I had done was built, to your point, a simple starting point that was a, you know, here's how to get a hold of me. And to your point, answered a few questions about what I do, who I help, and why that that matters. I probably would have moved much quicker towards actually driving business. And when I had business coming in, I could have then invested in a more robust website that actually drove leads. And uh, then I would have wanted to work with someone like you because that's something I don't want to take on. Right? That, that could take forever. Yeah. So let's talk about what that looks like. What does, when we actually start to, to bring someone on uh, to help us, what should we be looking for in a company like yours? What are the kind of things that you want a strong partner in web building to, to have uh, in terms of criteria? Well, I think initially when you're having those conversations uh, with different agencies or freelancers, you need to uh, get a sense that they've done this before, obviously, but they should be able to tell you a timeline. They should be able to ask you good questions. What I usually do in our first conversation is dive deep into their business and understand it, figure out what their goals are, uh, because sometimes clients will come to me saying, I want a new website or I wanted to have X, Y, Z, but I need to understand why they're asking that because sometimes it's not actually what they want. Usually people say I need a new website, it's because they want more customers. And so we need to understand what the actual goals are so that we can build the website in a way that supports those goals. So make sure that they are asking good questions, trying to understand you and your business, what you're offering, uh, and make sure that they are clear on what it takes to get there. And instead of just hand waving a lot and saying, oh, well, you know, it could take four months. I don't know. Usually our sites are six to eight weeks. We have a pretty tight 
uh, schedule, and we'll only deviate that if from that if our uh, if the scope is much larger. Uh, and so we will know that up front. That will be included in our proposal. Uh, we'll tell you this is what you can expect. So that that all lets you know. Okay, this person, you know, has an idea of what they're doing. If you want, I can kind of go into the details of that timeline. Would that be helpful? Yeah, why not? Let's do it. So what we do is we start with the design phase and we'll come up with some mockups, typically for the home page, maybe one of the other uh, pages that uh, is interesting and get some feedback from the client uh, and make sure that they feel it's representative of their brand. Um, and, and this is really important because we talk about first impressions. You have to make a good first impression with your website. So it needs to look professional, it needs to look clean, it can't be cluttered. But then you also have to consider what's different about this brand that needs to come through, right? So if we had a very Spartan website for a therapist, eh, they might not feel warm and welcoming, right? So we'd want to keep it clean while also maybe using some warmer colors or some softer layout elements that make people feel comfortable. So we start factoring in those things to make sure that it's a good fit. And once we've determined that good design fit, then we can start uh, mocking up the rest of the site uh, and move on to actually implementing the functionality of the site and the messaging on the site. So um, obviously once, I mean, the design is important, but then the messaging is the next important step, right? Making sure that the words you're using are speaking to the people coming to your website. You have to understand who your target client is, who, who is that visitor on your site. Uh, and if, if they feel like you're yelling at them when they're coming to you for help, okay, that's a turnoff. So maybe let's, phrase things a certain way and this goes into copywriting i'm sure you've had other people on here talk about messaging and uh, you know how you write for your brand and such so we do that in the messaging pass we do an seo pass make sure we've got the technical bits in place with the meta tags and the sitemap and all that and then we make sure all the functionality is working so any integrations that we have any forms uh if we've got any zapier triggers we gotta hook up if we're connecting to you know, Dropbox files in the back end or if we're setting up a membership site with a login, we get all that working. And then we do uh, about a week of testing at the end, make sure everything works in different browsers and looks good on different screen sizes. And then we launch. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think it's good for everyone to see, you know, like the steps along the way, what to expect. You know, uh, from what I'm hearing, you know, you start with the, like what people would expect, the general look and feel uh, to make sure that that, it matches what what their purpose is and what their style is. You, you bring that out of them. You get the messaging right that makes sense for their audience because you want it to register with the people. And then you get into the actual nitty gritty, the science of it, how to make the things work in a way that actually uh, is user friendly and functional. And then you're, you know, at the end, you're doing some optimizing along the way. I like that about that first stage because I think that the art of that I find interesting. Figuring out, because there's a lot of websites out there, there's a million ways to design something. How do you help people understand, like, how do you match their personal tastes and preferences with the best practices in design? Well, that's why that initial conversation is so important. That's why we have to ask a lot of questions to understand them uh, so that we can try to capture them. And it's also something that not everyone is able to do. So, while there are freelancers who can build you a website, they might not be experts in design. So if you go with an agency like ours, we have graphic designers to do that step. And we got copywriters to help with the next step because each step is a specialized thing. And so while one person, yes, can do all of it, it might not be at the same level of quality, you know, compared to when you have an expert doing each level of that. Yeah, I don't know how many times I've like, hired you go you hire like a just a designer and they can make it look fine and then you're you're actually getting the things running and you're realizing there's all these things that are breaking along the way because the actual science of it the constructing of it they're not a developer they're a designer right. and realizing along the way the hard way that they're not the same person and not everyone has both skills does lend itself to like wanting to have an agency along the way. And then you're like, well, they don't even tell you what you should write in the website. They're counting on you. So yeah, having a team, this is a big endeavor. Uh, having a team to help you along the way, I think is, is definitely important. Um, but let's talk about that. Let's talk about the uh, 
how that team comes together. Why is each component uh, so important? Uh, and how many people are like contributing to this process uh, when you work with an agency? Well, I guess it probably depends on the agency, but for us, we have the graphic designers, the copywriter, uh, the actual front-end developer are the one who's building out the pages. Uh, and then we've got kind of the webmaster person who understands the technical back end of things to make sure that uh, the site is optimized to load quickly and is going to be indexed properly and actually works in different browsers and all those things. Um, and you sometimes want to make sure you're not stepping on toes, which is why we go in an order, right? We do the design first and then we start picking up messaging and then we actually build it out. Because if you try to start building the site too soon, you're going to be wasting a lot of time going back to fix things. And that's much more tedious. You're going to miss something uh, and it's much more painful. So by doing it in order, it just works better that way. But we always start with a plan up front with everybody who's going to be working on the site, talking about it so that if there is going to be a pitfall, we can avoid it because, you know, the, the webmaster is going to think about things that the designer's not. And so when the de designer says, let's do it this way, the webmaster can point out, uh, actually, can we tweak this one part? Because by doing that, we can save like four hours of work or whatever it is, right? Yeah. So what are some of those things that you're seeing that when you're looking at other websites, because, you know, people either build it themselves or they hire like a one man team instead of an actual team uh, that maybe didn't have all the skills. What are some things that you've come across that you that are like obvious to you? You're like here's why like you need our help here are the things i keep seeing over and over again that are common uh not on purpose but the common mistakes that are happening out there when people are doing this these kind of things well there's a few things that everybody does images are one of them we've kind of touched on it like you said you did on your website too like they're really big and sometimes if you're not a technical person you don't understand how it works in the computer right you just know i have an image i want it here great now it's showing up i did it the problem is your uh, image might be four times as big as your monitor because digital cameras these days take huge pictures, but then the browser will squish it down to show it to you, but it still has to load that whole image. And so that's a bunch of wasted bandwidth and time that it takes to load that. So why does that matter? First, why does it matter? Uh, because not everyone has a high speed internet connection. So while you might not, not even notice it on your computer when you're building your site, it comes up pretty quickly. Uh, someone down the street, goes to your website and for them it might take five, 10 seconds to load that one image just because maybe they're still on a DSL line or some shared, uh, you know, five megabit line. I don't know. Uh, people's internets can get slowed down in a variety of ways too, especially if you're on a shared line, someone in the next room is doing a big upload. That's going to kill your download times. So uh, any of that, it all matters. So you need to be as optimized as possible, uh, even for mobile. Uh, if you're on the go, connections sometimes are not as fast. If you're in a coffee shop or something, they usually will rate limit you to give you only a certain amount of bandwidth so to make sure that everybody has some. But if you're trying to load some website that's not optimized, you're just going to sit there and think that it's really slow or they're not maybe professional enough to have a good website. So this all reflects back on you. People associate the website with you and your business. So you have to take the steps, uh, whatever reasonable steps you can to make sure that loads quickly. How does that connect to us being found on things like Google too? Uh, well, that was going to be my next uh, thing Please. that I see people do wrong a lot. SEO, like they don't know about it or think about it. So there are millions of websites that just say home in the title tag because that's the default page or title, right? For a home page. But that doesn't tell Google anything. It doesn't tell Google, is this a site about home goods? Uh, is it like Home Depot? You know, if someone searches for uh, my a new home in Colorado, should I show them your website? So that's a missed opportunity. You have to put in some keywords that are relevant to what your business is uh, so that Google knows when to show your page to other people. Uh, so that's one of the quickest, easiest things you can do for SEO. Go in find your title tag and change it from home to something else. Like for me, I wouldn't just put Frobro as my title tag. I can keep that in there, but it'll be at the end. I'm going to say web design, SEO, and premium hosting for overall web technology, something like that. So when someone's searching in Google, that's what comes up. If you actually look in the Google uh, search results, that blue link at the top of each entry, that comes right from your title tag. So that's what people are seeing. That's what Google's using and relying on to know what your page is about. 
So if I have the wrong title tag and my page doesn't load very fast, Google's saying, this isn't relevant for this person searching and it's slow. There's a better website to, sh to show you. Is that is that what I'm taking away from this? Yeah, you do get dinged for those things. I mean, Google does look at the content on your page as well. But let's say your blog post and your competitor's blog post are the same. Basically, exactly the same content, not word for word, but, you know, pretty good. If their site loads faster, theirs will rank higher. That's a deal breaker for Google, right? They're looking at those things because they want to provide users with the most relevant, most helpful uh, results possible. That's why people keep going back to Google. And that's why we say Google instead of search the internet. As It's a verb because they, they figured out the best way to sort through all these websites and give you the most relevant, most helpful ones. So are there a couple other things, I mean, that that are some common mistakes you're seeing? Or, I, I didn't want to interrupt your list, but I wanted to dive a little deeper. Uh, are there some other things you're you're running into that you see all the time? Sure. So back to the images, you can always add uh, alt tags and title tags on the images. Uh, that, again, is just telling Google what the image looks like, because it's not going to know what's in that image if you don't tell it. So it, it won't know this is a picture of Brandon unless you put uh, in that tag, Brandon Berkmeyer. So now when someone searches the Google Images section, that image might come up. But the title tag, H1 tag, would be the next kind of technical thing that people can improve on. If you don't know coding or HTML, then this might sound intimidating. Uh, it's usually not too bad. In page builders, it might just list it as header or heading one, heading two, heading three and the text will get smaller with each successive level. Those are actually clues to Google what the content is about. So heading one is usually the biggest one on the page, and that's something like contact us or about us or services, because it tells Google what that page is about. But you can get more specific and put in a relevant keyword that people are actually searching for to use there. So next to the title tag, that's probably the next most important tag on the site. And you shouldn't have more than one, though. So don't try to stuff your page with H1 tags because that usually means there's a problem and Google doesn't like that. Google really doesn't like people trying to trick it or game the system. Uh, and that's why they keep updating their algorithm uh, over time. And the people that were trying to do that, they then lose their rankings when Google figures out how to uh, detect what they're doing. The other tags, H2, H3, those are just basically dividing sections of content. So Google understands, okay, this block of content is about uh, retirement. This next block is about final expense insurance. So it's helping it categorize the content on the page. And that's important for long form content. So if you're doing an ultimate guide to podcasting, you're going to want to make sure you're using all those different heading tags appropriately. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And I know that for some people, they're like, guys, I know this. And for others, they don't. But I wanted to cover some of this this foundational stuff first, because there are people who like this isn't their job, like marketing or web design is not their thing. So just understanding the basics is important, because especially even if you're going to hire someone, you need to be able to speak the language a little bit and know like what the heck you're paying for. So I think I appreciate you breaking down the foundational stuff to us. I do want to get into a couple of the advanced questions in a minute. But I'd love to hear a little bit about, number one, like, how did you even get into this? And then two, like the website, frobro.com. Uh, I'd love you to explain that to the listeners because they probably heard that and were like, what is he talking about? Um, so what, what, how did you come into this website, uh, design, website, optimization world? Sure. Well, uh, I was always interested in computers and technology growing up. I mean, I built computers. I uh did projects on the computer whenever I had to for school instead of writing stuff out. Uh, I studied computer science in college, and uh, I always did websites on the side for friends and family because I was the technical person that they knew. Uh, so at a certain point, I decided to make it a business uh, so that I could help more people and make it more official, right? And uh, started with web design, quickly added to posting and maintenance, uh, and then like we touched on earlier, when someone wants a new website, they actually want more customers. So uh, I added SEO and ad management, these things that are ways to get people to that website. So if step one is making a good website that works and is functional, then the next step is getting people to it. So SEO is a great way to do that. Ads are another way to do it. 
Um, and so I've just expanded my services to help businesses utilize their website. So there's not just something they paid for and just sits there and does nothing. Like, I want them to have an ROI for their website. Uh, and so these are good ways to do that. And how did the Frobro name come about for all this? So I didn't know I had curly hair until high school. <laughs> I always had a crew cut flat top. Um, my mom was always saying, you should grow your hair. So I finally did between sophomore and junior year of high school. And it turned out my hair was curly. And so it just kept growing. I had a big fro. It was interesting. People liked it. Uh, and I apparently have good hair. It catches attention. I mean, girls would be walking down in the hallway, crowded hallway between classes. Someone would reach out and touch my hair. I don't know who it is. They just wanted to feel it because it looked, I don't know, soft. And another time I was uh, walking on the boardwalk in Mission Bay. Two girls riding bikes opposite direction. One of them almost crashes her bike trying to reach out and touch my hair as she goes by. So it, uh, it makes you stand out. And, and so that's the parallel there is if you have a good website, it's kind of like a fro. It catches attention. People notice you. And that's what you need in a website, right? You want it to stand out. You want it to capture attention so people stay on your website rather than moving on to the next one. So uh, fro bro was a, a nickname. There's another guy that had a fro in college. We were both working as RAs, resident advisors. And so we were fro bros. And that's where the name came from. And yeah. Okay. So, so real, I appreciate that. And I love a little bit of personality. But so, real talk though, did you ever doubt that choice? Yes. I always really wanted to do it, but I did have to kind of go through like, okay, is this the best choice for a business name? Are people going to think it's weird or strange? Uh, and it's kind of just doubting myself, you know, is this, you know, does it make sense? Does it work? But at the end of the day, I think it is a good branding choice uh, because it does what I was talking about. It makes the brand stand out. It's memorable. It's different. Um, and it's not just boring. There's a lot of boring business names out there. So that's why I went with it. Well, I appreciate that. Because so for me, I think you obviously you have to know that the person you're working with is an expert in what they do. But if it's someone you're going to work with a long time, you kind of want to enjoy their personality. You want to, and it does help to stand out. It does help to be memorable overall. So I think if like if people choose, right, based on the brand you put in front of them, they choose this person's for me, this person's not for me. There's plenty of people that I'm sure were like, no, frobro.com, not for me. But there are other people that are like, do you know what? This is the kind of person I want to work with. And I bet you it aligns with your personality and you guys get along great, whoever would end up choosing you uh, along the way. So I appreciate that you're putting your personality into your brand. It was one of the reasons I said yes to this. I was like, if someone has the, the balls to be themselves and be the face of their business and put it into their into their expertise, like, let's do it. Like, I'm all for it. Go for it. So like, kudos to you for that, man. I do want to pivot and talk a little bit about um, some of the advanced uh, like SEO stuff, not like things that are going to bore people and roll their eyes. But uh, two main topics. One has to do with content. I'm a big fan of people creating content for just to find their voice, to become experts in their industry, to build a platform for their media. How does content affect their website and creating a lot of content? How should they be? How does it, how does it matter to them? And then we could talk about how they should be doing it. Well, I, and this is a really important part. Uh, so I'm glad we're talking about this. I think... If you're going to be doing that, you need to have a content strategy because otherwise you're going to be bouncing around to whatever you happen to be thinking about that week, which can work. But if you, it's always better if you have a plan, right? How you're going to use that content. You've got multiple channels where you're going to post it. Uh, but this can also affect your SEO because the more content you're posting, uh, you now have content that is potentially rankable for people to find you. And if you don't do it intentionally, you're going to actually cause problems for yourself. So there's something called keyword cannibalization. If you have multiple pages on your site, maybe there are different blog posts talking about the same thing, competing for each other to rank for that same keyword, you're now fighting against yourself. So there are things you need to do to make sure that your internal link structure is done correctly so that you can essentially tell Google, yeah, these ones are similar, but send most of the link juice to that one. This is the authoritative page on my site about this keyword. So you would make those less important pages link to the more important pages. So it's okay to talk about different things or talk about those things multiple times. You just need to be intentional about how they're linking together because otherwise 
you're missing that opportunity of all that content that you're creating. So might as well use it as another avenue for people to find you. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's like if I want to Google, you know, how to uh, potty train my dog, that is one link that's probably really important to a website. Someone's probably created a keyword like content for that, but maybe their most important thing on their website is how to train a dog, like their ultimate guide to how to train a dog. Mm -hmm. And that how to potty train is just one little step that's going to take me to their bigger ultimate guide along the way. Is that what we're talking about here? Is like thinking about what those steps are, where we're trying to drive people. Right. It's kind of the hierarchy of the content, uh, making sure that you've determined which pages you want to focus on. And, and I tell people we like to focus one keyword or one keyword phrase per page. So don't try to make your homepage rank for five different things. Focus on one and then have a dedicated service page that you want to rank on for that service. And each service should have its own page. Each product should have its own page. That way you're not competing with yourself. Now, I imagine like as I did and a lot of people I know do, when they get out there, they, they went out, they built the website, they started creating content, putting content on the website. If they then are like, you know what, now it's time to clean this website up and hire a pro. We've probably done, done a lot of damage along the way that you have to undo. So I'd love to hear like what is really happening when someone's coming to you and they've already got to build a website that's been around a few years uh, and it has content on it. What are you coming in and doing and helping them with that's uh, going to result in some return for them? Well, we start by doing a full site audit and looking for all the things that they've done right and the things that they've done wrong and make a list of all the opportunities we have for improvement. Uh, and then we'll make a plan, a prioritized plan of what we're going to fix based on what they have on their site. So we'll start with the things that are going to make the biggest impact, fix those first, uh, and then we'll move on to the more tedious tasks to clean it up because they do matter, but it's also going to take longer and you're not going to see as big of a return for it. So that's why we start with the important things first, obviously. Is it better to, as soon as we start creating content, to start working with an agency to help us with this kind of stuff? Or is it like easy enough to clean up if you're already a year or two in uh, along the way? Like, are, should we, are we shooting ourselves in the foot? Is it costing us more money? It's like, if you build the house the wrong way, you got to tear down the house and then rebuild it. Is it harder or is it is it fine either way? We can always come in and fix it later. The opportunity cost though, is the time that has elapsed since we start fixing it, right? Because uh, time, is something that actually feeds into your authority on Google. So the longer you've been established somewhere, that helps your ranking. So if you can get those things ranking earlier, then that helps as opposed to getting those things ranking later because now you've got more competition and you're starting from a lower point of competition. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it absolutely does. And so along the way, because a lot of us are content creators, a lot of people that, I, that I'm talking to here, are they need to create expert content for their website. What are some of the things that you're seeing that you're like, here are the things that I'm fixing all the time. And maybe it's similar to what we you see at the start. I don't know if there's anything different from like an ex, a built website versus a new website. Things that you're that spending you're spending most of your time and hours on uh, for a website that's been around a while. Yeah, it's hard to say. I mean, every site's a little bit different. Um, the main thing is making sure the important pages are uh, optimized for a given keyword that's relevant to them. Uh, I, I do see a lot of business owners, even ones that think that knew about SEO and they say, okay, I wanted to try and rank for something. They just arbitrarily pick keywords because they think it, maybe it makes sense to them or that's what they would type into Google. Uh, or that's just, it's usually just how they describe their service, but it's not how most people search for that service. So we do the keyword research up front to determine, okay, if you're using that keyword phrase, you've only got five people a month searching for it. But if we change it to this one, it's still, you know, maybe it's a synonym or something, but now you've got 5,000 people a month searching for it. And obviously you want to get in front of more people. So we would switch and use those based on the keyword volume. Yeah. Well, okay. Selfish, selfish question for, for you here, for me. Let's say you got 200 different blogs on your website. And a lot of us podcasters have that. A lot of us were creating randomly at first and then got more organized along the way. Uh, across 200 different articles on the website, how do you begin to organize those those keywords? Like for, for that many pieces of content? Because 
you know, eventually I'm going to run out of keywords to use. I mean, I wouldn't, but like, what's the, the approach here to getting organized with something like that? So I touched on that with the audit, right? We have to do, it's basically a manual site walk where we're going through the links and assessing each one and checking the keywords that they're being ranked for. And does that make sense? So that wouldn't be the first thing we do, but it's something that we have to start on. And maybe we'll do a certain number of pages per month to go through those, get them properly indexed, make sure we're using a good keyword for that and make sure they're linking properly to the other pages. So it's just tedious and painful. So that's another reason why if you have someone helping you with this from the beginning, you can do this along the way and it saves time, um, but it can always be done later. It's just kind of a, a manual tedious process. Yeah. And I guess along the way you have phrase, once you add phrases to the mix, the phrases, there's a lot more variety in phrases than there are in just one word, two word keywords. Right. And I should clarify, I, I'm saying keyword, but that means keyword phrase. Uh, it doesn't have to be just a single word when we're talking about keywords. So there's long tail keywords. Maybe you've heard that term, but that just means it's more specific and it's usually more words. So instead of uh, podcasting, it might be uh, podcasting about branding. So that's a longer tail keyword. It's more specific. It's going to be less competitive than just the word podcasting. Right. So like, to rank for. Yeah. Like podcasting versus how to start a podcast. Right. Or exactly. It, yeah. Instead of podcast equipment, it might be how to pick a microphone or something right. like that uh, along the way. Well, I, uh, I'm sure there's a lot that all of us listening are thinking to ourselves, man, this is, this is something I've been meaning to do. This is something I've been putting off. I'm afraid of how much needs to be untangled on my website right now. And I'm afraid of the, the pain of fixing it. I'm afraid of the cost of fixing it. Uh, what would you say to those people that may have that fear um, that are already along the way um, in terms of finding someone taking a step forward and, and getting to do this? Well, the good news about having us do it for you is you don't have to deal with that pain. We will because... We have experience doing it and we can minimize that pain. We have a process for going through it and uh, organizing it in a you know, pretty efficient way. Uh, the other thing I'd say is the money that you're spending, it's not just money out the window. This is actually an investment into the site because it's going to improve the ranking over time, which brings you more customers on a daily, monthly basis. So it's actually investing back into that website to make sure it's giving you a return for whatever cost that you spent on it initially. So it's helping you get more out of it. And the longer you wait, the more of an opportunity cost there is. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's so true, right? I think it's like we are we are our own worst enemies in that. The the cost of doing something once, like I, I talk about building assets a lot and marketing assets, and it's the same thing. You fix this one time and it now works appropriately, more efficiently, more effectively every time moving forward. And the opportunity there is really, it's what's been lost by you not doing it. And then it's, how many more customers and money are you going to have coming in because you fixed it? You fixed it one time. You're not fixing it every month. You're fixing it this one time at first. I'm sure there's optimizing along the way, but the big fix that I'll, I'm sure a lot of us need can be a huge investment in your business that can see return pretty quickly, uh, I would imagine. Yeah, there's definitely some quick wins on the low-hanging fruit that I've seen turn around you know, within five days. Depends when Google re-indexes your site. You, know, you can have a big jump in ranking. Yeah. Well, Jeff, I appreciate all the knowledge you've been dropping for us today, um, but I will give you the, the floor here to say, you know, is there anything else you want to give our listeners today in terms of just things you want to share with us or uh, any final parting words? Well, I just want you to, everybody to know you can make a better website. <laughs> I want to rid the world of terrible websites. You can start doing that on your own by taking some of these tips that we've talked about and applying them. Uh, you can work with people like me to help you get to that point. But think about all the annoying websites you've gone to and don't let your website be one of them. So that's my takeaway. <laughs> fair words and fair warning for you guys. Don't let your website be one of them. That Those annoying websites that drive you guys crazy. And if you guys, like I said, if you believe in the knowledge you've heard today and you want to work with someone that you like and you're vibing with our friend Jeff here, go to frobro.com. Go to check out frobro.com and get at least one of the, I think you offer free audits. Is that right? Yes. I'll do a free SEO audit or just a free consultation. If you want to talk about ways we can 
work on the website or marketing channels and such. Yeah, give it a give it a try. And if it if it works for you, maybe it'll be the one thing that you've done in your business this year that actually made a dent and brought you closer to your goals. Uh, appreciate you, Jeffro. <laughs> Jeff Jeffro is what his name says on the, the screen here. It's hard not to say Jeffro. <laughs> Go for it. You can say it. That's my nickname. Uh, but thanks for coming on the show today. I appreciate you, man. And as always, everyone, thanks for listening. And I hope that this brings you some new knowledge, some new tactics that you can apply to your brand, to your business today so that you can thrive tomorrow. Appreciate you guys. And we'll catch you next time. You've just taken your marketing knowledge to another level with this episode of Brands on Brands. But we have plenty more ways to help you build a brand that matters. Head over to BrandsOnBrands.com for resources, as well as access to our blogs, videos, and exclusive coaching sessions with your host. Be sure to visit BrandsOnBrands.com.